Hello, lovely saints of Christ Church in Tyler, Texas. Hello, rest of the human race, uh, possibly watching this on the big wide internet. Welcome, welcome to Christ Church in Tyler. Um, I'm Father Matt Bolter. It is my joy today, it is my privilege to uh, make my contribution to our Eastertide Christian Formation class. Uh, in 2020 as part of the clergy team at Christ Church in Tyler. Um, I would like to open, as, I, as is my custom whenever I teach Christian formation classes, I would like to open today with the collect of the day, uh, which in this case is the collect for the fifth Sunday in or of Easter. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Welcome. It is a joy to be with y'all today, and we are going to look at um, a passage from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 16 through the end of the chapter. I think that's verse 34. Um, but I want to start out today, I want to start out like this. Around the year 50 or 51 of the Common Era, a boat was traveling along the eastern coast of the Greek peninsula, heading toward Athens. On that ship was a man fleeing from a recent attempt on his life. That man's name was Saul, or as he came to later be known, or, or, or as he came to later be known, um, St. Paul. Within a few days after his arrival at what's believed to be the port of Piraeus, this man would set in motion a series of events that would hold tremendous and cultural significance for the history of Western civilization. I should, I should add uh, that much of the material that I'm using for this class uh, comes from a University of Michigan scholar of late antiquity named Yaron Eliab. In fact, some of what I have today is actually a direct quotation uh, from him. Now, Paul had been a passionate Jew all of his life. Born in the city of Tarsus in current day Turkey in a wealthy Jewish family, he was highly educated in Greek philosophy and culture, as well as super well versed in the Hebrew Bible, which as many of you know, um, was widely circulating at the time in its Greek translation known as the Septuagint. Uh, we have looked at the Septuagint in previous Christian formation classes, particularly last summer when we were um, studying the apocryphal slash deuterocanonical literature together. Um, now, by the, by the time Paul gets to Athens here in Acts chapter 17, the entire region has been under Roman rule for over 200 years, and yet Athens uh, still featured and held on to much of its cultural splendor. Uh, in many ways, it retained its earlier prior identity as um, a Greek center of culture, not just Roman, but also Greek. In the past, Athens had been home to the great philosophical schools of antiquity. Notably, I have in mind Plato's Academy and Aristotle's Lyceum. You will remember that Aristotle, who was also um, one of the tutors of Alexander the Great, uh, Aristotle was the disciple of Plato. And so there in Athens was found not just Plato's Academy, but also Aristotle's Lyceum. Aristotle and Plato had had some disagreements. They had something of a falling out. And so Aristotle, the disciple, went off on his own and started his own uh, school, the Lyceum. Even in the Roman era, 
However, Athens continued in this intellectual tradition and it had it maintained this intellectual aura, its streets teeming and buzzing with philosophers and intellectual activity. Wealthy families from all over the ancient world would send their children to study there, just as important, in fact, for our purposes today, at least as important, is the temple from which the city gets its name, the temple of Athena, otherwise known as the Parthenon, not to be confused with the Pantheon in Rome, the Parthenon, which crowns the Acropolis. I have a picture of the uh, Parthenon right here. What a beautiful building, what a beautiful picture. I've never been to Athens, uh, but many of you have. That is the Parthenon. Um, but in addition to the Parthenon, Athens was also host as well to the Temple of Zeus, which uh, you can see on your screen right now, the Temple of Zeus there in Athens. No wonder then, no wonder that the first verse of today says what it says in Acts 17, 16, namely that the city was full of idols, okay? You've got Athena, you've got Zeus, you have lots and lots of uh, religious, cultural um, witness and testimony to Greek deities and the pantheon of gods and goddesses of Greek culture, Greek and Roman culture. No wonder uh, does the first verse of our passage today, Acts 17, 16, no wonder that it says that the city was full of idols. And I would now like to read our passage that we're looking at today. Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others, others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind breath and life and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all 
by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, now, before we continue, oh, oops, ah, I wasn't quite finished. Sorry about that. Um, he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection from the dead, some mocked, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, Y'all, what, what an amazing passage. There's many things that I'm tempted to talk about in that passage. Um, I think that I will limit myself to just pointing out that this character near the end, Dionysius the Areopagite, um, he becomes very famous in the history of Christian thought because there was a, a, an individual who lived four or five or six centuries after Christ named Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite, who produced many, uh, many, many, many texts, Christian texts, texts of theological and, and philosophical importance. And he adopted as a pseudonym uh, Dionysius the Areopagite. And for centuries, the early church thought that those texts were produced by this man, who is identified here in Acts 17 and was converted by St. Paul, when in reality it was a medieval writer and it was not until Thomas Aquinas that people began to say, oh, we don't, we don't think that this is actually the historical Dionysius the Areopagite. We think that this is a person writing in, in, in the sixth century. Uh, but, but anyway, that's one of the reasons why Dionysius the Areopagite is super important and super famous because he serves as the pseudonym for a later thinker, a later philosopher, theologian in the history of, of the church who was very, very influential on people like St. Thomas Aquinas, okay? But um, what I wanna do next is I wanna ask a question. I wanna ask a question for you, and the question is this, why does the lectionary include a whole series of passages from the book of Acts uh, for the Sunday Eucharist, Eucharistic readings during Eastertide. Now, I know that uh, the other clergy of Christ Church have done a great job in this series so far, um, but I, I wanted to address this particular question. Why Acts? Why does the lectionary give us the book of Acts, and why in the Eucharistic lectionary? Uh, uh, you might remember uh, from earlier in the course that, that that's how we determined what we were doing for our Christian formation class at this time, the clergy agreed that we would teach a class on the lectionary readings from Eucharistic, from the Eucharistic lectionary year A in the Book of Common Prayer, coming from the Revised Common Lectionary. We all agreed that we would not preach on this, the, those passages from Acts, but Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we would instead uh, teach a Christian formation class, class over those passages. But the question that I'm asking you right now is why Acts? Why does the lectionary include a whole series of passages during Eastertide <coughs> for Christians and for those of us in the church for us to read and meditate uh, and hear in the book of Acts or in, in Eastertide? Why the book of Acts and why Eastertide? That's the question. And I think that the answer is really, really interesting. And I wanted to to suggest that the answer to this question is because the framers of the lectionary understand rightly that the church, according to the book of Acts, is an Easter community. The church is an Easter community. Uh, we just read a passage from Acts chapter 17 that mentions the resurrection not once but twice, and that's a clue uh, to how important the, the doctrine of the resurrection is in the book of Acts. But really, um, it's even deeper than that because what the book of Acts is actually saying is that just as uh, the body of Jesus was raised from the dead and raised to indestructible life, so also the body of Christ called the church is also raised from the dead and in the power of the Spirit given 
energy and indestructible life to implement the victory of God in Christ. So in other words, as for the literal body of Jesus that was raised from the dead, so also for the mystical body of Christ, the church, which is also raised from the dead and which is also empowered by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit to live in the resurrection life and energy of Christ. Now, I wanna prove that to you real quick in a couple of ways. Uh, in other words, the basic point that I'm trying to make is that according to the book of Acts, the church is the body of Christ. According to the book of Acts, the church is a continuation of the body of Christ and a continuation of the life of Christ. And I wanted to just point out two uh, passages real quick to sort of prove this to you. Um, I'm trying to convince you that according to the book of Acts, <clears throat> Christ is still present in the world in the form of his body, the church. Yes, it's true that Christ ascended into heaven uh, and the disciples watched him go up at the very beginning of the book of Acts, that's true. Uh, it's also true that in some sense, Jesus of Nazareth is now seated at the right hand of the Father. That is also true. But the book of Acts insists that the body of Christ is still present, still alive, still active in the world, not as what the church fathers called the Soma Typicon, the typical body of Christ, the literal body of Christ, uh, the Jewish carpenter that ran the lathe over the furniture. No, no, not in terms of that body. That body ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. But instead, the church, uh, Jesus Christ is still present in his body, the church, his mystical body, the church. This is a super big deal for the book of Acts, and I want to try to prove that to you, to convince you of that um, with just two verses today. And the first one, is the very first verse of the book of Acts, Acts 1.1, 1, 1, um, which says this. Now, before I read it, I just want to remind you that remember that the book of Acts is the sequel to the book of Luke. Luke is the prequel to Acts. Acts is the, pre, uh, the sequel to Luke. Luke-Acts forms a two-volume set um, of gospel truth written by Luke. And so... Um, after Luke had finished writing the book of Luke, he then turns his attention to volume two of his story, which is the book of Acts, and he opens up that story like this. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until, <clears throat> until the day that he was taken up into heaven, okay? Now, did you catch that? <laughs> Luke says something super, super interesting in that verse that it is so easy to gloss over and miss, but he says, most excellent Theophilus, that volume one that I just finished writing, that was a story about what Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, the implication here is that volume two, the book of Acts, in this volume, in the continuation of this story, Luke is going to continue to narrate what Jesus does. In other words, there, there's a seamless continuity between what Jesus began to do in the Gospel of Luke, flowing over and continuing on in the book of Acts. In other words, Jesus is still active. Jesus is still present. Jesus is still doing things. It's just that he's not doing them um, in the same way that he used to. He is now doing things. He's now active and present and ministering in the world in and through his body and in through the members of his body, the church. I hope I'm making sense. Acts 1.1 definitely teaches um, that Jesus is continuing to act, continuing to bring the kingdom of God. It's just that it's in a radically different form and it is now in and through his body, the church. It is the church as the people of God, the church as the body of Christ that is now called according to the book of Acts to continue the ministry of Christ. Uh, and I love the way that N.T. Wright tends to articulate this. He says that the job of the church that we begin to see in the book of Acts is to implement the victory that Jesus Christ Christ 
achieved on the cross, to implement the victory that Jesus Christ achieved on the cross. Okay? So I wanted to uh, appeal to chapter 1, verse 1, in my effort to sort of convince you that, that in the book of Acts, Jesus is continuing to do his ministry. It's just in a different form, namely that of his body, the church. But also, exhibit B, to make that same point, I wanted to bring to your attention chapter 9, verse 4, chapter 9, verse 4 of the book of Acts, uh, which is one of the three, and I think the first of three different narrations of the conversion of St. Paul, the experience that he had encountering the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Acts 9, 4 says this. Actually, I'm going to read verses 3 and 4. Now, as Paul was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Close quote. Acts 9, 3. Actually, that's Acts 9, 3 and 4. Yeah. So, so the risen Christ looks at Paul or looks at Saul and says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, let me ask you a question. At that point in Saul's life, had Saul ever persecuted Jesus? No. Um, at that point in Paul's life, had Paul ever even seen Jesus? No. Uh, we do read that Paul was involved in the martyrdom, the stoning of St. Saint, of Saint Stephen that Deacon Stein talked about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but that was as close as Saul of Tarsus ever got to Jesus of Nazareth, as far as we know. Saul had, had never persecuted Jesus. Saul had never met Jesus. Saul had never seen Jesus. And yet the risen Christ uh, 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 appears to Saul on the road to, the, to Damascus and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The risen Christ doesn't say to Saul, why have you been persecuting my followers? No, he doesn't say that. He says, why have you been persecuting me? And, and y'all, I hope that you can see the importance of that. Here again, the book of Acts is making it very clear that, that there is a mystical union between the followers of Jesus on the one hand and Jesus Christ himself on the other. In other words, the body of Christ is mystically united to Christ in other words, um, what is true for Jesus Christ is also true of the body of Christ, the church, okay? And so that's why you can see that in the same way that, that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead and began to live in the power of the Holy Spirit in a new way, so also the body of Christ is raised from the dead and empowered to live by the Holy Spirit with resurrection power in a new way, okay? That's what I'm trying to say to you. So the question is, why does the lectionary include a whole series of passages from Acts during Eastertide? And the answer is because the church has been raised. The church is now living in the power of the Spirit in the same way that Christ has been raised, the church has been raised. As for Christ, so also for the church. In other words, the, it's not just Jesus Christ who is an Easter who, who, who is experiencing the power of Easter. No, the church is also experiencing the power of Easter. Put it a different way, it's because the church is an Easter community, okay? Y'all, I only have about five or six minutes left, and so I want to sort of close this class uh, with three concluding points uh, from Acts chapter 17, verse, verses 16 and following. <clears throat> three things that really jumped out at me as I meditated on this passage. And the first one is that the Easter body of Christ will experience heartache over idolatry. Uh, the main thing that's going on in this passage is that Paul is moving in to Athens. Um, he's, he is overwhelmed. I mean, the, the first verse that we read, verse 16 of chapter 17, um, indicates that Paul was emotionally uh, burdened, that, that Paul was experiencing some sort of anxiety, some sort of emotional pressure and weight. Um, 
as a result of what he saw. It says uh, in verse 16 of chapter 17, it says that Paul was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And so the first point is that the Easter body of Christ, of whom St. Paul was and is a member, the Easter body of Christ will experience heartache over idolatry. I don't have time to articulate this very much, but uh, last Sunday I preached about um, Meister Eckhart, a medieval mystic, and Meister Eckhart famously said that we should all pray, Christians should pray, God rid me of God. In other words, God rid me of my concept of God. In other words, God free me up from every concept that I have of you, every attempt that I make to put you in a box, to think that I understand you. God, free me from all of my idolatrous thoughts about you. So Christians can be guilty of idolatry with our concepts. We can be guilty of idolatry uh, with the things that we're trusting in in our hearts. We can be guilty of idolatry um, in the way that we live our lives, in the way that we spend our money, in the way that we spend our time, all of that is true. And we should remember Meister Eckhart's prayer, God, rid me of God. That is to say, God, rid me of all false gods, of all idols. And so the first point here is that the Easter body of Christ will experience heartache over idolatry. That's both the, uh, the idolatry of the world and the culture, also the idolatry of the church, which is very real, and also the idolatry in our own lives. Secondly, though, the, the, the takeaway, the second takeaway that I'm uh, getting from this passage in Acts 17 is that the Easter body of Christ is motivated with an energetic boldness and desire to engage our culture slash world with the gospel. Y'all, I'm talking about apologetics. I'm talking about evangelism. Um, it's, it's interesting that one of the first things that Paul does in Athens is he goes to the synagogue, right? He goes to the synagogue and he's lamenting uh, the state of the city, um, how all of these masses of people, people created in God's image, people for whom Christ died, all of these masses of people are being deceived. They're being led astray by false gods. And he, he goes to the synagogue. It's very interesting. He goes to the synagogue despite the fact that in his previous uh, location, Paul had been persecuted by the Jews of the synagogue. And yet he's so committed to uh, his community. He's so committed to the community of God's covenant people that he returns to the synagogue in Athens. And he is saying to them, oh my gosh, can you believe the idolatrous nature of this city? It's breaking my heart. And I wonder what those fellow Jews in that synagogue, I wonder how they responded. Um, it's possible that they responded in a similar way that, say, you might expect Episcopalians to respond, uh, which is to say, eh, Paul, you know, you don't have to get all hot and bothered. Paul, just calm down. Paul, it'll be okay. Paul, you can't change the world. Um, it doesn't tell us what the reaction of those Jews of the synagogue of Athens was in response to Paul's uh, words, in, the, in, in response to Paul's confrontation of them. It doesn't tell us what their response was, but it's easy to imagine that they were not quite as bold, not quite as passionate, not quite as motivated as St. Paul was to go out there and engage the culture. Why is that? Well, uh, we're not told, uh, but it probably has something to do with resurrection. Uh, the faith of the Apostle Paul um, has a new urgency to it, a new reality to it that is caused by the resurrection. Um, yeah, and y'all, I'm about to run out of time, so I'm gonna just read the third point here. And that is that the Easter body of Christ is open to the reality of God and God's activity in the world as mysterious, bigger than expected, and will resist the temptation to reduce or to domesticate God. That also reminds me of Meister Eckhart, God rid me of God, God help me to remember that you're bigger uh, and more mysterious than, than I tend to expect. And isn't it amazing the sorts of things that St. Paul says in this passage? I mean, St. Paul was certainly not some sort of relativist, 
Uh, he, St. Paul was not one of these people that say, hey, all roads lead to God. No, Paul was not like that at all. And yet it is amazing the sorts of things that he says in this passage. Uh, he talks about this unknown God. He looks at the Athenians and he says, I can reveal to you who this unknown God is. He looks at the Athenians and he says, in God, we live and move and have our being. He says, that's not true just for me. That's not true just for the Jesus followers. That's true also of you. You too live and move and have your being in the one true God of Israel, Yahweh, the father of Jesus Christ. It's amazing what Paul says to our ears, especially for someone like me who sort of grew up in a very conservative evangelical ethos in the church. Um, Paul's words almost sound kind of liberal, kind of crazy. It's important, by the way, that we not be more conservative um, than the apostles. And I think that sometimes that is a temptation, particularly in the Bible Belt, to be honest. Um, let me reread chapter uh, point three, and then I'm going to close in prayer. The Easter body of Christ is open to the reality of God and God's activity in the world as mysterious and bigger than expected. And the body of Christ, we will resist the temptation. We should resist the temptation. Lord, please help us to resist the temptation to reduce or domesticate God. Y'all, it's been a real joy to be with you today to lead you through this portion of Acts 17. Um, and now what I would like to do is to close us in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, and God bless y'all.